The following are excerpted highlights from the 45-minute videotape, Joran on Quality Leadership. For details of the full-length version, please contact the copyright holder. Joran on Quality Leadership is a 45-minute video message for upper managers. It addresses the crucial questions of quality management faced by senior managers everywhere. From his vast experience, Dr. J.M. Joran brings a head-on and specific message. With an international perspective, and in the no-nonsense terms business leaders use, his theme has a strong ring of reality. Let me start with the assumption that you want quality leadership. That is a safe assumption. So the real question is, how do we go from here to there? What must we do differently from what we have been doing? I'm going to propose some answers on how to go from here to there. These answers are derived from real life experiences. Numerous companies have already been impacted by severe competition in quality, especially from abroad. This competition relates to quality in the sense of customer satisfaction and product saleability. Other companies are severely impacted by quality problems in the form of product deficiencies, failures which create customer dissatisfaction or which create high cost of poor quality. Many companies have tried to regain their quality leadership as to product saleability. They have also tried to bring down the cost of poor quality. Some of the companies have made good progress, others have not. We at Duran Institute have received a good deal of feedback from many of those impacted companies. We have analyzed that feedback in order to identify the commonalities. What were the actions which converged to produce good results? What were the roads which led nowhere? My message is really a summary from all that feedback, a summary of the lessons learned. The first of our lessons learned is that most of those failures to make significant progress were due to a poor choice of strategy. As a result, the approach was doomed to failure no matter how well the execution was carried out. Let me explain the nature of that choice. The upper managers of those impacted companies looked over the options which were available to them. These and other options were urged on the managers by advocates, insiders as well as outsiders. The upper managers then made their choice from these options. Within two or three years, many reported that the choice they had made did not pay off. But why did so many companies choose strategies which failed? The main reason is that the upper managers, despite their competence as business managers, lacked adequate working knowledge of how to manage for quality. Lacking this knowledge and pressed for action now, the managers made a choice which seemed reasonable. In the dialect of the marksman, their choice was ready, fire, aim. But they would not have made such a choice had they been adequately grounded in the subject matter. That brings us to the next lesson learned. To make a wise choice of strategy, managers need adequate knowledge of how to manage for quality. The knowledge needed to manage for quality turns out to be surprisingly simple. It consists of just a few fundamental concepts. Once these fundamental concepts are grasped, managers can much more confidently apply their prior experience and training to formulate a sound strategy for quality leadership. Some of these concepts can be derived by analogy, by looking at the concepts which underlie financial management. Financial management makes use of three well-known processes. First, financial planning. This process sets out the business goals, develops the actions and resources needed to meet the goals, translates goals and action into money, and summarizes them into the financial budget. Second, financial control. This process goes by such names as cost control, expense control, and so on. Third, financial improvement. This process aims at doing better than the past, 
It takes such forms as cost reduction, purchase of new facilities to raise productivity, and so on. Managing for quality uses those same three processes. When we apply these three processes to managing for quality, they become quality planning, quality control, quality improvement. The three processes of this quality trilogy interact with each other. It all starts with quality planning, the process of establishing quality goals and developing the means for meeting those goals. Quality planning consists of a rather standardized series of steps as follows. Identify the customers, both external and internal. Determine customer needs. Develop product features which respond to customer needs. Products include both goods and services. Establish goals for those product features. Develop a process to meet the product goals. Prove that the process can meet the product goals under operating conditions. Once planning is complete, the process is turned over to the operating forces. Their job is quality control, to run the process and meet the planned product goals. Let me demonstrate with the help of a visual model. In this model, the horizontal scale is time. The vertical scale is quality in the negative sense of percent of product deficiencies or cost of poor quality. What goes up is bad. The quality planning process is at the left-hand side of the model. At time zero, operations get underway. It soon becomes evident that product deficiencies abound. In this example, the products produced are deficient in various ways, resulting in a total of 20% deficiency. Why are the products deficient? Most usually, the deficiencies are traceable to the quality planning process. That planning process, for whatever reasons, has resulted in that high level of product deficiencies. In effect, it was planned that way. Under conventional organization structures, the operating forces do not have the responsibility and or the resources needed to replan the processes to get rid of the deficiencies. However, they do have the responsibility for quality control, and that is what they do. In simple language, the job of the operating forces is to maintain whatever quality level has been planned into the process. Their job also includes putting out fires, such as that sporadic spike on the model. Here, product efficiency soars to over 40%. The operating forces take steps to bring the quality level back to around 20%. The third process in the trilogy is quality improvement. In this model, the result of improvement is to reduce the chronic level of deficiencies from the original 20% down to a much lower level. In this case, about 3%. Let me note here that without exception, the companies which have made great progress toward quality leadership have done so by carrying out a great many quality improvements. These improvements take place project by project and are carried out by a universal improvement process as follows. Identify specific projects for improvement. Organize project teams with responsibility to discover the causes of the deficiencies and develop remedies. Prove that the remedies are effective under operating conditions. Deal with cultural resistance to remedial change and provide for control to hold the gains. Quality improvement is applicable to all industries, functions, and processes. We note that once the planning is complete, there's no clear responsibility for improvement. The operating forces take over, but their job is quality control, not quality improvement. How then have some companies managed to make so many quality improvements? The resounding feedback 
is that they did it by establishing a new organization structure and new managerial processes specially designed to make extensive improvements in quality. It is perfectly natural for upper managers to look for ways to delegate the quality revolution to subordinates. After all, ability to delegate is one of the essential skills of a manager. Upper managers in a great many companies have tried to apply this traditional delegation concept to launching a quality revolution. Generally, these managers realized that they were dealing with something out of the ordinary, something unprecedented. Hence, they resorted to extraordinary ways to transmit an unmistakable signal. They employed well-designed spectacles, slogans, and banners to impress indelibly on their subordinates that quality was now to be the top priority goal. Generally, these exhortations did raise the visibility of the quality problem. However, any resulting improvement in quality generally fell far short of the upper manager's hopes. The reasons for these shortfalls are clear and they should be understood by upper managers. The exhortations try to secure action from middle managers who already have full time and clear responsibility to control, to meet an array of formal, legitimate goals, budgets, schedules, specifications, quotas. Resources have been provided to meet those goals. Performance is evaluated and a merit rating system rewards performance against goals. As viewed by middle managers, the exhortation approach is vague in all respects. Goals, responsibility, resources, evaluation. The prior control responsibility remains in effect, as does the merit rating system. So the middle managers keep on doing what they've been doing. The vagueness inherent in the exhortation approach cannot possibly compete in priorities with the structured, legitimate system of goals, responsibilities, resources, evaluation, and merit rating. In my experience, these same shortfalls have cost many companies two or three years of delay with associated internal divisiveness. Here and there, the upper managers have lost credibility. They were perceived not as leaders, but as cheerleaders. In managing for quality, as in managing for finance, there are certain essential activities which should not be delegated by upper managers. Serve on the Quality Improvement Council. Approve the broad quality goals. Allocate the needed resources. Review progress. Give recognition. Serve on some project teams. A realistic look at those tasks and the purposes behind them leads to the conclusion these tasks should not be delegated. Too much is at stake. Being essential and not being delegable, these tasks should be performed by the upper managers personally. Such are the realities. Our feedbacks have made clear that the most influential factor in successful quality revolutions has been the active participation of upper management. In fact, to our knowledge, Every successful quality revolution has included the active participation of upper management. We know of no exceptions. It all adds up to a complex revolution, and the complexity explains why so many efforts have failed. However, there have been enough successes to prove that success is achievable and to show how to go from here to there. So good luck. And in the words of a dedicated revolutionary, long live the revolution. You have been watching Highlights of Duran on Quality Leadership. The full-length 45-minute version contains greater detail on the Duran Trilogy and what steps managers need to take to put the trilogy into practice. Duran on Quality Leadership comes with a comprehensive synopsis booklet and a set of visual aid masters. The full-length version is intended to be viewed in senior-level staff meetings where quality leadership is a major agenda topic. A discussion period should immediately follow the viewing. Joran Institute provides a wide range of educational products and services devoted to the concepts of managing for quality. 
quality of goods, services, processes. These products and services are oriented to management, not to technology or statistics. The emphasis is on the manager's approach. First identify the problems, then mobilize the company's resources and skills to deal with the problems. Finally, choose and apply whatever tools and techniques are appropriate to solve the problems. Our offerings are centered around the Duran Trilogy of quality processes. Quality planning, quality control, quality improvement. All of our offerings provide a practical step-by-step -step approach to managing quality. Participants are given specific tools, techniques, and methods for attaining and maintaining quality leadership. Duran Institute's goal is to provide you with practical common sense solutions to the continuing challenge of remaining competitive in quality. Great strides are being made in quality. We are proud of Duran Institute's contribution to this progress and we dedicate ourselves to continuing to earn your support in the future.